Hey, good morning. Thank you, everybody. Um, I feel like after that introduction, this, the pressure is really on, uh, especially since here we have every uh, idea being recorded for uh, posterity for all of history. Um, so I hope to live up to the, the kind words that Todd's uh, said about me this morning. Um, this is a talk about software uh, that isn't about software. Um, you know, it could probably also be titled How to Drive Yourself Crazy by Overanalyzing Everything uh, and How to, you know, Lose Friends and Annoy People um, by Getting Stuck in Infinite Loops of Existential Metaphysical Sorts of uh, Philosophical Thoughts and Ideas. So, 10 a.m. Everybody ready for some really heavy thinking? Uh, this is me. I'm Corey. I go around and look at things and learn things and talk about things and meet people and I'm interested in stuff. Um, I'm interested in ideas. Uh, I live in Denver and on the internet. Um, and I'm kind of a lazy student, uh, learn by doing type of person, um, less of like an academic uh, sort lately. Uh, so that's sort of where a lot of this started. Um, you know, I realized I like doing a lot of other things besides writing code. I like listening to music and hiking and eating and watching movies and reading and all these other things. And, and so I started asking, well, what can I learn about software while I'm doing all those other things? Um, so that's, that's sort of the origin of all of this. Uh, I want to first start out by thanking um, everybody that helped put this event together today, all the organizers, the other speakers. Um, thanks to all my friends who helped me kind of get my ideas together and encouraged me to, you know, explore this path. and. Uh, challenge myself by giving this presentation. Um, and most of all, thanks to all of you for taking time to be here together uh, and learn today. Uh, hopefully we can all grow and make the craft of software better um, by our actions here today. Uh, so along the lines of thinking and learning, um, you know, one of the reasons that I decided that it was fine to try and like draw a path through all these other things in life um, and apply them to software was the Apprenticeship Patterns book um, where Dave talks about uh, taking a different path than the linear one. Um, you know, starting with a pattern and just kind of seeing where it leads, seeing what correlations are interesting and, you know, winding your way through the, through the information that way. Um, and that concept's interesting to me. Uh, another, another talk that kind of inspired me uh, in this direction was um, Glenn Vandenberg's talk about real software engineering. Uh, which I saw at Ruby Hoedown, uh, I guess, a few years ago now. Um, it's online. There's a Confreaks video from Lone Star Ruby in 2010, um, and there's a link to it. Uh, but it's really cool, um, and he kind of draws a lot of analogs between software engineering and you know engineering in the real world. Um, and I'm going to draw a lot of hopefully reasonable analogs between software engineering and all sorts of other stuff. Uh, so I'm an associative thinker. I'm really interested in learning about learning and cognition. Um, not very well read on the tub topic, just sort of like weekend warrior kind of curious. Um, I'm interested in building a more integrated and intentional sort of life, right? So taking all the things that I'm interested in and figuring out how to make them work together um, instead of a compartmentalized sort of life where, you know, I work eight hours a day and then I'm myself after that and, you know, this other, you know, bicyclist or whatever on the weekend, or, uh, you, you get the idea, hopefully. I I'm also consider myself like a lifelong student and lifelong learner. Um, and, you know, I hope that at this point, you know, craftsmanship and software development have evolved enough that we can agree that, you know, the, the art of creating software and the work of creating software is about a lot more than just interacting with a screen and a computer. Um, you know, it's largely about people. You know, we're making software with people, we're making software for people. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, sort of interpersonal and communication aspects that uh, I think are worth considering and thinking about. Um, I think we can learn a lot from other domains there. Uh, because I don't know about all of you, but I'm, um, you know, pretty typical, like, antisocial geek and not very good at, like, you know, going out and socializing with people who don't talk about computers and the same sorts of things that, you know, I'm interested in. Uh, I also believe that lessons are everywhere. 
Um, they're all around us. Like there's all sorts of interesting things that are just waiting for us to notice them and see them and and learn from them. Um, but we have to be open to those, right? We have to be like mindful and, and sort of present in order to benefit from them. Uh, so now you kind of have a lot of the context and the background on on where this started. Um, another big push, you know, which helped me in the direction of thinking about these things was I got sick of code. I got tired of screencasts, tired of tech books. Um, this is kind of cool, it's in a movie theater, but I got a little bit tired of conferences. And I needed to take a break. I needed to step back. Uh, burnout, I believe, is the term. Um, and I'm sure probably a lot of you have experienced it, and if you haven't, you know, at some point it's likely that you will. Uh, but 24-7 code does not you know, a happy, balanced life make, um, in my experience. Uh, so I took a break. I had fun. I went snowboarding. I went out to eat. I you know, went hiking, um, read some books, did all the other things that were a part of my life that I'd sort of neglected for a while. And what was interesting to me um, was during that break, I learned a lot about software from the other things uh, that I never expected to. So I also realized I wanted to find a better balance between working and not working, um, between consuming, producing, uh, learning and teaching. Um, and as such, I thought you know, I'd come and share these ideas. Um, and hopefully you know, some of you have thought about this stuff already, uh, and we can all sort of iterate together. Another reason I feel like these ideas are important um, is because you know, software is sort of still a relatively new discipline. You know, in terms of you know, looking at like, the legal tradition or the legal career, you know, their processes and practices have been around for a really long time. Um, ours haven't. So it still feels like we're sort of writing a part of the story right, that we're going to leave behind for future generations. And when we talk about legacy code and legacy systems, you know, this is the legacy of software craft. And you know, every day when you're writing code and when you're working with your team, you're doing it. Um, so it's kind of important to be like mindful of, of these sorts of things and think about what is the story that we're writing. Uh, you know, what is, what is the structure that we're leaving behind for future generations of software developers to maintain? Um, we talk about the maintainability of our code and systems, and so how about the maintainability of our, our culture and our craft? Uh, I think what we focus on is important, and you know, we can try to be more functional, think more functionally, um, and leave a, leave a better story. Um, so a lot of this, like I said, is probably going to be obvious to some people. Um, some of it's going to probably be obvious to a lot of you. Uh, but most or all of these ideas are sort of new to me, so please bear with me. Um, I'm trying to understand how they work together and the best way to connect them, uh, but, but it does require some patience on your part. So here's the plan. Uh, here's, here's what I'm thinking. I've, I've sort of put together a way to you know, draw analogs between software and other aspects of life. Um, so I'm going to kind of go over that. Uh, and then some examples or observations that I've had. Uh, and then what I'd like to do is kind of have a conversation, see what observations or insights you all have and what you, know, what you think about all these ideas in general. Um, and then we'll go back over it and, and hopefully have something valuable to take away at the end of all this. Uh, I think it's important to you know, review and reflect and incorporate knowledge into our practice um, in order to become better students. So the framework that I'm kind of proposing uh, for an analogizing any aspect of life to software um, is looking at a few simple aspects. Um, what's the same? What's not the same? And what's the point? Uh, so the intersection or the parallels are the, the obvious correlations, right? The things that are the same about software and you know XYZ domain. The differences are things that either only software has or only you know, uh, the other domain has. Um, you know, think about things like the main value proposition or the main function of a program. You know, functional programs take input, return output, you know, and, and they're all built around their main function executing. Um, you know, they're stateless and uh, elegant solution to a lot of problems. Um, so consider you know, in another domain or in another ecosystem or system, like what's the input, what's the output, and then 
you know, what are the pieces that compose the main process? Uh, how do they win? How do they lose? Um, how do their actions support their, their goals? Uh, some other things that we can consider, I think, are the problems that uh, people face in another domain. Um, how they happen, uh, how, they ad how they're addressed, right? Um, look, at, look at the history of the industry. Uh, you know, do they have a longer tradition than software or, you know, shorter? Um, and consider their communication. Consider the style, the pace. Uh, you know, you're going to have a lot of different sort of, you know, message passing, if you will, in, uh, in a legal proceeding than you would at a burger joint. Right? So if you think about message passing being, you know, two systems communicating through an interface, you, you know, you adapt. You would address uh, an attorney much differently than you would address a guy who says, you know, do you want fries with that? Um, and it's all good, right? It's all just communication, but if we can be aware of that, you know, perhaps we can have more effective communication, have more effective exchanges, um, and get more value out of them, and everybody, you know, benefits from that. Yeah. So how do we integrate the lessons that we see? Um, I think that you know, when we look at the similarities, we say, OK, well, we both have this, this process. We both have the, the idea of message passing. i use that as an example. Um, you know, how do they do it? How do we do it? You know, and can we learn something? Can we optimize from that? Um, what's different? Does this other domain have something that we don't? Uh, is there some wisdom that we can derive from that or something we can learn there? Um, and if so, what is it and how do we incorporate it into our practice? Uh, another question I think it's important to ask is, do we have something they don't? Right? Do we have something that they could use? Um, can we sort of give back to these other domains that we study and engage with uh, in order to better them? I think as, as uh, I wish I could talk, that'd be great. Um, and thank you, that one person who laughed. That makes me feel a little better. I'm really nervous. I don't know. I've, I've done a few presentations, and I always just get like super anxious. I talk too fast. It's, it's a train wreck, uh, but it's fun. So, so the thought is like, all right, consider Square as a case study. Right? So they must have had the realization somewhere along the line that buying stuff at a point of sale kind of stinks. You know, some of these places have old credit card terminals that take forever. You know, the paper is expensive. I mean, it's just a mess. So they came up with a pretty clean, like, ubiquitous way for small merchants to take payments. And they applied their technological abilities to make another domain better. Um, and in my opinion, they kind of won because I, who doesn't know who Square is? Yeah, nobody. So you all know who they are because they did a cool thing. Um, so not every moment's an ideal learning moment, right? And more so, not every moment is an ideal teaching one. I have the problem where I go around and like see all this stuff and try to like instantly like communicate these lessons to the people around me. And sometimes we just want to go out and have fun and eat dinner, right? And not talk about like how everything is related to everything else. So, so try to be mindful of that because uh, you can drive yourself nuts with this stuff, I think. Um, but let's remember the spirit of open source. You know, if we can give something back um, when we get some value, you know, maybe we should try and do that. <sighs> okay. So, here are all of the things that have been keeping me awake at night. I'm trying to figure out how they're like software. Baseball. The other day I was sitting at breakfast with a friend and talking about this stuff, and I'm, you know, I said, well, asked him if he could think of any examples of what I'm trying to talk about here. And he said, well, yeah, I, I played baseball growing up. He said, and it was fun. Um, and what's interesting to me about it, you know, sort of a behavior that I still apply in my software practice is reflection. So, you know, in the middle of a game, um, you know, in the middle of an inning, right, you're going to focus on different things than you would uh, in the postseason. So for example, I mean, if it's the first inning, maybe you're not so worried. Uh, but if you're in the seventh inning and you're down, you know, you're worrying about 
uh, the pitcher's speed and strength and like what he ate for breakfast this morning and the exact, you know, choke on the bat. Like really, really finite details. Because you're in the middle of a cycle, right? It's like being in the middle of a test-driven development cycle. You're focusing on what are we going to name this variable and, uh, you know, what is the API to this module or what have you. Um, he said, and, and then after the season, you know, I would think about different things. I would think about, uh, you know, how did I play in relation to my team, right? Like, what was my role? What was my function in the team? How did I relate to my coach? Um, in the same way, I think we can think about, you know, how we are relating with our software team. Um, how are we relating with our stakeholders? Uh, like, what is our function within our organization? Right? It's interesting. You know, you just think about it like, kind of like picture a baseball field and a baseball team and like overlay that on top of your um, workplace or office. Oh, see, see what makes sense. And then think about how do baseball players improve their you know, their practice. Um, you know, what, what, can we, what can we learn from there? Uh, another obvious comparison is that, you know, when we achieve something good, we call it a win. You, know, you win games, that's, that's the point of a game, to try and win. Uh, running bases is kind of like completing milestones. I mean, just, you know, play around with it a little bit, see what makes sense to you. Um, another sports comparison, and, and these are probably like really flimsy because I'm not much of an athlete, uh, but rugby, and I'm not going to get into the whole scrum thing because that, that's the obvious one. Um, but what I've been learning from rugby, uh, specifically women's rugby, um, is, is kind of interesting to me. Women's rugby is a reasonably new sport uh, in the U.S. There aren't a ton of teams, and there aren't a ton of spectators, right? So you don't have an arena full of thousands of people cheering and uh, encouraging, but these are some of the most incredible athletes I've ever seen, right? They like punish themselves day in and day out to become stronger, to become better at their game. They study it and they're in love with it, right? And they're doing it just because, you know, it's what they do. You know, it's what they love. They love the game. Um, so I respect that. I have an easier time respecting that than I do, you know, say a professional athlete who's getting paid uh, ridiculous amounts of money and acting um, in a manner which is, let's say, inconsistent with my personal values, right? Uh, these, these women are heroes, in my opinion, um, and I think that we can learn about how to become stronger and more dedicated and uh, just a better person in general by, by studying what they do. Um, another thing that's interesting to me about rugby is that you can tell what a player uh, is expected to do by the number that they wear, right? So the number on their jersey correlates to their position, um, you know, and, and the position that they play kind of dictates their actions and what they do. Um, I think it'd be in, it's an interesting thought to me to think about, like, what if we all had a jersey with a number on it that gave people clear indication of exactly what they could expect from us, right? What if our clients could just look at us and say, here's exactly what I'm going to get from that developer. Um, here's exactly how they're going to you know, run across the field. Uh, I mean, granted, you know, there's, there's some room for style and there's some room for personality there. But by and large, you know, a person's uh, position sort of determines, is determined by their, their attitude, their body type, and their personality. And it likewise sort of reflects uh, a lot of that um, as well. Uh, so naming, right, kind of goes to the idea of accurate naming. Um, separation of responsibilities uh, and making it clear what the behavior of a module or function should be. Um, also kind of speaks to the idea of like constant training and retrospection, like constant evaluation and refactoring. Um, you have to look at, like, you know, when I tackle, how's my stance? So there are very sort of things like that. When I, when I refactor, um, what's my process? Am I methodical? Do I go through and write a test? Or do I just hack and slash and then hope at the end of it everything is green? Uh, so I was trying to represent that with a Ruby hash. 
Another funny observation that I have is that Ruby and Rugby are only one letter apart, right? So maybe give it a five minute read on the Wikipedia page and see what you can learn from that, just, just for the sake of having names that are so close together. Uh, and Bill Murray thinks you're awesome, by the way. Um, another cool phenomenon in Ruby, they have this thing called the social, right? So both teams, like, it's a violent sport. Has anybody ever seen a rugby match? Okay, a few people, yeah, yeah. It's like brutal, yeah? So these people are basically like out on the field, you know, for all intents and purposes, trying to kill each other, as far as I can tell, right? Uh, and they get beat up and cut up and bruised and scraped and, you know, at the end, sort of somebody wins, maybe. It's kind of hard to tell. Uh, but after the game, players from both teams get together and the home team always hosts this thing called the social. So the social is basically a big party where they hang out and drink and have fun. Probably not dissimilar to like an after conference event, right? Um, and even though we're all from different companies, we're all from different teams, you know, maybe have competing interests, uh, we can all get together and celebrate the love of the game together and try to figure out how to improve it, right? Like how we can all become better. Uh, user groups, communities are, are the same type of deal, you know, people from all walks of life in all different places, um, and we're all just trying to figure it out. Uh, also like software, rugby, not that old in the grand scheme of things. I guess in its modern form, it's been around since the 1830s. You know, so longer than software development, but not as long as like philosophy per se. Uh, snowboarding. And one of the best days I had was this, this killer week where we got a bunch of stuff done, wrote a bunch of tests, shipped a bunch of features. Like at the end of it, I just didn't want to see any more code. Um, but we accomplished a lot. And then we went snowboarding. And I learned a couple of things that day. First, that I am a horrible snowboarder. Um, I fell down, I think, more than I rode down. Uh, but what I started to realize about halfway through the, the process was that it's not really about trying to make yourself go. You're not pushing yourself. You're not moving really of your own volition. Um, you're trying to balance. And gravity does the rest, right? So, so you're trying to balance and you can control a couple of different things. You can control your direction and you can control your speed mostly. Uh, probably if you're better than I am, you can do it very well. Uh, you know, it's a lot about balance, which I think makes sense in a lot of areas of life. I think in software, um, the idea of balance between adding and deleting code or features, right? That's worth thinking about. Um, if you're just adding code and behavior all the time, you're going to end up with a bloated, hard to maintain system. Um, you know, if you're leaning forward all the time when you're snowboarding, you're going to end up on your face. It's not great. Uh, you know, another thing that you pay attention to is sort of the other people on the mountain, right? Because it's all good if you're like going a million miles an hour and you're having fun. Um, until some inexperienced skier kind of crosses your path and then you know one of you has to be able to get out of the other's way and guess what it's probably not the novice uh, so as as more experienced software developers and more experienced mentors you know what what sort of ideas can we take away from that that you know are like you know how can I get out of this person's way um, or how can I help them avoid making a mistake uh, also, we look at you know, the tools that we use. So you know, your height, your weight, your experience level, and where you're going to ride, and sort of what you're going to do if you're going to go on half pipes or try and do all the crazy like X Games backflip stuff. You use different implements than you do if you just want to have like, a nice, like, winding, mellow um, trip down the mountain. Uh, so consider the tools, right? If we want to ship a product really fast, we're going to use different tools than if we want to build some crazy, like, super optimized, distributed, uh, service-oriented architecture, right, for an established company. Um, the right tool for the right job, you know, we can think about gear and infrastructure and all those sorts of things. Um, I feel like it's also 
appropriate to analogize like the size of the mountain to scale. Um, the idea of the size of your team or your project, um, your experience level. Uh, you know, we're all trying to get down the mountain the best way that we can. Um, and I think that that's a reasonable metaphor for life and for software. Um, it's going to happen one way or the other, you, you know, on your own or on the snowmobile or the ski patrol or, you know, in flailing limbs end over end. Um, so you might as well try to balance and focus and glide down gracefully. Yoga? Any yoginis here? Yes. Not very many. Um, it's something I've been interested in and studying a little bit lately. Uh, again, you know, a lot of the ideas there are like balance, focus, strength. Um, core strength as a developer, right? Probably a relevant thing to consider. Are you great at systems? Are you great at API design? Uh, are you great at front end and UX? Or are you more of a, a leader or project manager, right? Are you better at organizing? Um, focus on your core strength and how you can improve that. That, that's something that yoga teaches. Um, it teaches how to strengthen the body for meditation, which the idea there is that you're strengthening the mind. So as software developers, I kind of feel like it's a valid thing to try and seek a, a clear and a strong mind. Um, those are some of the <laughs> goals that are supported by yoga. This is a picture of the Hindu deity Ganesha, um, who is revered as the remover of obstacles. Right. Uh, so in a stand-up, who's done daily stand-up? Hopefully a lot of you. Okay, good. Yeah. Right? So we talk about what our blockers are. Right? What are our obstacles? What I'm curious about is what are Ganesha's tactics for removing obstacles? And how can we apply those to our you know, daily software practice? Um, you know, just things to think about, really. That's all, that's all I'm trying to present here. Uh, so balance, focus. The responsibility of a module, right? Single responsibility prin principle, like what is this behavior focused at? What's the problem that we're trying to solve? Um, you know, th these things apply at a lot of different levels. So, you know, you have to be able to learn how to like kind of navigate up the stack and look at low level details versus high level details. But um, hopefully these are reasonable things to think about. So a restaurant, I feel like a restaurant is a lot like uh, a software team. And I was sitting out at dinner the other night um, kind of, kind of working through a problem uh, of how to parse some data, and you know, was, was, you know, software problem. And I'm sitting at this restaurant, thinking about like all of the back end processes and like the the front end processes, right? So if if the front of the house, anybody ever worked in a restaurant? Okay, yeah, I spent a lot of time working in a restaurant before I was a software developer, so I'm, I'm sure that's where this comes from. Um, but the back of the house and the front of the house uh, are like the difference between your, your infrastructure and your user experience. Um, there are a lot of processes and phases that go into software just as there are processes and phases that go into uh, creating a meal in a restaurant. Stuff we don't see. Um, and then there's the stuff we do see, you know, the aesthetics of the place, the, uh, the lighting, the pictures, the music, um, maybe smells, right? Um, so. All of these things sort of determine the overall user experience and the quality uh, that they deliver. Um, you know, and they're trying to strike a balance. You, know, you can think about the chef's tools as, as your tool chain, right? Are you using Git and Vim? So are you using like super sharp samurai knives? Or are you using, oh, who do I want to insult here? <laughs> are you using CVS and Ed? Right? Now I know who the Unix people are. Hats off to you guys. Uh, it, it's, it's crazy. You know, the, you know, it's all about the experience you want to create. There's a place in Chicago that I like to eat. It's called Al's Italian Beef. And you go and you order an Italian beef sandwich. And it's this amazing, like, uh, sautéed in, in brine. And it's great, right? It's, it's greasy and it's... It's delicious, and you eat it, you know, at the counter, like standing up, and that's a very different experience than going to a five-star restaurant and sitting down for a formal, you know, eight-course meal or something like that. And it's, I like food, so I'm good with both, but they focus on different things, 
You know, are you a small software firm or are you a giant company? Um, should you be focusing on, you know, shipping great user experience at a very small scale, or are you trying to cater to, you know, hundreds of millions of users over uh, a nationally distributed like service-oriented architecture? Um, if you're big, go look at how a big restaurant works. Figure out how they become more efficient and, and learn from that. And if you're small, you know, go to a little cafe and see how they work and just, just see what things look like at, at different levels and in different places. Um, I think in my abstract I promised that we'd talk somewhat about food. So here's a picture of some delicious sushi that I ate. Uh, Another area where I think like food and dining maps to software is that you know food is art that is made to be destroyed. It's made to be consumed. Right? So they put all this effort into you know cooking and preparing, like sourcing ingredients, figuring out a menu, um, you know executing a dinner service, and at the end of it you eat what they made and it's gone. Right? So I think that Code and software are, are real similar. We, we put all this work into it. We ship a product. It's consumed by users. And they, they give us feedback. They say, this is good. This is bad. You know, cut this piece of behavior out of the system. Cut this item off the menu. Um, you know, or I've been sitting here waiting for two hours for my meal. What the heck is wrong with you people? Like, if you guys watch Kitchen Nightmares, the Gordon Ramsay show, like, yeah, it's sweet to just, like, watch him come into this restaurant or whatever and completely shatter these people's delusions about what they're doing. You know, you have these restaurant owners of these places that are failing miserably, and they're thinking, well, it's fine, I don't know what the problem is, or, or, or it's this manager, or it's this server, or it's, you know, X, Y, Z, they're trying to play the blame game. We do that in software projects all the time. Uh, and he just comes in and lays waste to their misconceptions and says, no, you know, you're all the problem. Like, this all has to work together. Um, in a software team, everybody has to work together or we can't ship. We have to work with the stakeholders or we can't give them what they want. Uh, you know, your code has to work together. All the functions and modules have to, have to interact appropriately. Um, you know, your infrastructure all has to work together. So it's a great thing to see how all of these small cycles and, and functions tie together uh, to create an amazing and delicious meal that you can just destroy. I think marriage is a lot like software. Um, you know, we bring in these third-party dependencies and all this other code. Uh, you know, if you're trying to ship something really quick or ship a prototype, you basically like gem this, gem that, bundle, install, good to go. Um, and I've done that without thinking about it, you know, hundreds of times. And then a year later or two years later when they stop supporting that third party library you're using or it's time to upgrade Rails or, 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 like it's nothing but a giant mess of fail. Um, it's like we're marrying these third party libraries. And some interesting, you know, I think some valid questions to ask if you're going to marry a person are, you know, do our values coincide? Um, what are our kids going to look like, right? <laughs> Nobody wants ugly babies. <laughs> it's okay to laugh. You can either laugh with me or at me. Like either is fine. <laughs> you know, laughing is good. It's fun. Um, yeah, you know, this is a little cynical, but when it's time to remove those third-party dependencies, like how messy is the divorce going to be, right? Are they going to take all your like half of everything? Um, and leave you paying for it for the rest of your life. Uh, it's, it's a little dark, but you know, it's worth thinking about. Um, other things that I think we can learn from marriage are about like, communication. Like, you have to work through some tough things. Like, have conversations that are not fun um, and deal with some stuff that's like a drag. Uh, in order to build a stronger relationship and get better results out of, you know, out of your time together, um, I think you can apply that sort of thinking to like somebody that you're going to be pair programming with long term. You know, what's the give and take? What's the balance? Uh, or with a project, like you're, you're marrying a project. You're marrying its goals. You're marrying its ideas. 
um, how about with a team or a company, right? So you're aligning yourself with all of these things, it, you know, whether you realize it or not. Um, might as well like be mindful of that and take advantage of that knowledge and and use that to make a more intentional decision uh, that that helps to get you where you want to go, wherever that is, down the mountain apparently. Nature, nature's pretty cool. I like it. Um, ecosystems, like, you know, there's a lot of them. Uh, nature is great, too, because I think that it adapts. You know, human beings can come in and, like, build a thing and, like, you know, it seriously impacts the natural ecosystem, but somehow it <coughs> figures out how to right itself in spite. Um, does your code do that? Like, how's your code going to adapt to the future? Uh, gardening is a lot about controlling conditions. It's about harvesting and yielding and finding a balance between those things. Um, and if you're gardening, you probably have bugs. And if you're writing software, you probably have bugs. So, you know, that's one of those, like, obvious one-to-one -one correlations that's just a gimme, basically. Uh, I was watching this show the other day called Life After People. And it talks about what would happen if, like, human beings were wiped off the face of the earth. Some giant catastrophe happens. Like, what the result would be. Uh, it was kind of cool. I had no idea that caribou and reindeer are actually the same species. Reindeer are just a domesticated form of caribou. Um, and so what they were exploring there was that uh, since these caribou have been domesticated, well, let me back up. I'll give you a little bit more context. Caribou every year make a 3,000-mile migration. There's about a million of them, right? And that, that's their thing. It's like part of what they do. So these domesticated caribou, like when, or reindeer, when the caribou come by, some of them try to join the migration, right? Like it's their natural instinct to try and like get back with the pack or the herd or whatever. What is a group of caribou called? Anybody know? Let's go with herd. All right. Um, yeah, so they try and like rejoin the herd. And so what they're saying is like if there were no more people around, these reindeer would basically try to rejoin the herd, and some of them would be able to do it, but some of them wouldn't, right? Some of them wouldn't be able to hack it. Uh, and so I think about, like, is my code going to be able to hack it in the wild, you know? Or is it too big and bloaty and, like, domesticated and lazy that when nobody's around to maintain it, is it just going to, like, fall over and die? Let's hope not. Um, you know, our work can become stale, um, not able to run in the wild, and somebody's going to come along and they will eat it. So we have to constantly refactor. We have to learn and improve and iterate. And you know, I feel like one aspect of craftsmanship is about improving the craft, which hopefully is why we're here today. Uh, so let's not build a, a community or a craft that is is you know sedate and sedentary and is going to have somebody come along and like eat our lunch. I like space too. Um, there's, I, I think it's a dis show on Discovery, like how the universe works. So I like to just sit there and like watch that and think about, you know, how does a solar system like a software system? Um, there's a lot of ways. I feel like I've like enumerated enough examples that we have the idea here. Um, but I will say this: space makes me think about scale. Yeah, there's small uh, galaxies and big ones, uh, you know, s small planets, large planets, and stars, and they all work a little bit differently. You know, the size is a factor, like proximity is a factor, orbit rotation. Um, it, it's a cool example of a lot of things working together in really interesting ways. Kind of like people. Dancing. How many people could be okay with the idea that dancing and pair programming have a lot in common. Okay, so everybody with their hands down maybe hasn't pair programmed. <laughs> you guys should do more pairing, it's fun. It's a great way to learn. Uh, there's, it's communication, right? It's back and forth, it's give and take. Um, there's a rhythm to it, right? So there's a lot of like small feedback loops that we have to kind of tune into. Um, in dancing, you get very immediate feedback and very subtle feedback from your partner. And, you know, it's about balance and, and communication. 
Um, I think pair programming is the same way. Uh, you know, you're responding to subtle changes. If anybody's ever done remote pairing, too, that gets really interesting because it sort of removes that, a lot of the visual cues um, and sort of the unspoken communication that happens. Uh, so, so now you have to pay attention to things like your pair's tone of voice and how hard they're hitting the keyboard. You know, I mean, if it sounds like keys are getting murdered, then you might need to step back and like take a deep breath and figure out what's eating them because, you know, you're not, you're probably not going to get it be as productive as you would otherwise if you're both like on a level and communicating effectively and, and you know dancing to the music. Oh my god, thank god he's done with all the examples. Um, it's your guys' turn to talk. So the framework again, the schema that we're looking at is, you know, what's what's a gimme? Like what's blatantly apparent? Um, scale, scope, process, variables you know, components, tools. Um, what's obviously not the same? Um, is there something that we can adopt or we can learn? Um, or is there something that we can give them or we can teach? Uh, and then finally, like, what are the lessons that we're learning from our reflection and introspection in order to achieve greatness? Um, how can we become better teachers? Right? Like, how can we know when to share our insights, um, or when to give them a pyramid of greatness that will help them achieve great good. Thank you. I, I feel like, yeah, like I, I really expected like a bigger reaction with the Ron Swanson <laughs> pyramid of greatness. It took us a while to read it. <laughs> yeah, I spent a lot of time like making the background. I probably should have like focused on saying intelligent things. <laughs> or you know some sense of cohesion in all of this, but figured throwing in the pyramid of greatness forgives a multitude of bills. Um, thank you. Uh, okay, so let's let's see. Now now you all get to like poke fun and tell me how crazy I am and like go write some code, you silly silly man. Uh, I think we have another microphone, so whoever would like to let, let's be courteous to one another. Like again, we're all trying to figure this stuff out, um, but I think if we take turns, we can hopefully have some interesting stuff happen. Who wants to start the bidding? This gentleman here? Here, I'll give you mine, because I'm sick of talking. <laughs> um, one thing you might take into account here is crafts. You know, we're trying to become craftsmen, and you know, the whole apprenticeship program and such. The guilds back in the Middle Ages had, for all these skilled trades and crafts, they had the process that you would go through. Mm -hmm. um, I weave, among other things. And so there's a, I hate to say it, but waterfall really applies to weaving in a lot of ways. Because hmm. you have to plan ahead of time what you're doing. And obviously, once you get into it, you adjust to it and make changes. But you, know, you have to know what fiber you're using. You have to know what pattern, what colors, what structure of the fabric. And then once you have that going, then you get into the process of building it. And it's not uncommon to spend 20, 30 hours before you even start hmm. weaving uh, in terms of preparation and such. But I guess the point is that, like you said, you can find inspiration anywhere in applications. And you know, even just taking care of your kids, well, especially taking care of hmm. kids, there should be applications. Right. Hmm. So that's that's a that's a journey I haven't taken yet, but I'm I'm kind of that's an interesting thought. Uh, I I think the craft metaphor applies really cleanly. Um, and actually, that's you know one of the things that I'm interested in is you know mentorship and apprenticeship and like uh, I'm mentoring an apprentice right now and like constantly trying to figure out how I can become a better mentor and how I can become a better teacher. Um, and also, I'm glad that we have at least one other systems thinker in the room who sees things this way, because uh, it gets a little lonely sometimes. Uh, so weaving, I like that. Um, you know, and actually, as you were going through that as an example, you know, the thought occurred to me that we have—I f I forget what the actual technical 
term for the phenomenon is, but it's like the shower effect. Like you get stuck on a problem and blocked. Does anybody know what the actual name is? Like you're stuck on something and you can't figure it out and then you go take a shower and the idea just, like your subconscious basically has a chance to work it out. Um, yeah, yeah, and, and helps you get unblocked. Um, but I think, you know, a lot of times when I've gone and, and made something, right, that helps to sort of move that process along and then as I'm making something with my hands or building something or whatever that's not software, you know, that moment of clarity comes through and, and then it's like, oh, cool. I can, you know, finish what I'm doing and then go solve my software problem. Um, again, that's a nice advantage of having an integrated life and like not being stuck doing one thing. Like you have to be able to switch contexts in order to you know, get that uh, effect to happen. Over here. I think, part of, I think part of this goes to the right brain, left brain, where if you're engaging the creative side, you're engaging the right side, and the analytical side, I believe, is the left side. Correct me, anybody, if I'm wrong. But if you can engage both sides, that's why pair programming is so good, because the person at the, I, I heard this expressed once, but I may, I may get it backwards too. But the person at the keyboard is engaging the left side. The person who is not at the keyboard is engaging the right side. You then have a whole brain working. It's in two different people, but it's a whole brain. So I think this, this may tie into the, the left brain, right brain theories. I see that making a lot of sense. Um, that's, that's another one of those things that yoga helps with for me. A lot of it is kind of about balancing out like, uh, you know, the sort of those, those left and right brain sort of aspects of, of your thoughts and yourself. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's gotta be, two heads are better than one is the, is the saying, I think, right? Um, and that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, here. I think, too, the more that we expose ourselves to different areas, the more we see patterns and are able to see patterns. And the more we're able to see patterns, the easier the software development piece gets. Because hmm. you can see how things fit together. You can see the system as a whole. Whereas otherwise, you tend to look just at a small piece that you're focused on. Yeah. I'm inclined to believe that. So, Corey, you've, you've created a lot of analogies between software and other things. And what I really appreciate about what you've done is you've taken a light touch to each of the analogies. This is kind of like this, and this is kind of different. And, and I appreciate that. I think in software, sometimes we take a detailed approach to analogies. So we try to say, software is just like manufacturing cars, and each car is like a story card, and, and each piece of uh, windshield needs to be moved along in a pulse system and you know we try to get into this really detailed analogies and you, you haven't done that you've taken a very light touch to it i want to say that because i want to take one of your analogies a little bit deeper and i want you to stop me if i shouldn't do that um so you said food is like art that's meant to be destroyed and code is kind of like art that probably right. that probably should be destroyed. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I want to get to. So do you think do you think legacy systems need to be constantly rejuvenated, mm -hmm. and that if a legacy system has been sitting there for ten years, it's like a plate of food sitting on the table for ten years. Hmm. I think that's an interesting comparison. I would almost go uh, at at a, a a little bit of a different level and say that legacy behavior needs to be reevaluated. Right? Cuz it's not so much the system that that I think I'm concerned with, but it's like what is this behavior? What value is it delivering? Like is this something we need anymore? And when you start looking at it from that aspect, um, I feel like you get into kind of like uh, opportunities to refactor your your business, right? You say, well, we're doing this because we had XYZ process that was, you know, some shipping fulfillment thing. But now we're a completely digital products company, so no, why would we need shipping? You know, like the more things that you can eliminate or kill or shut down or like dispose yourself of, I think the better. So yeah, the answer to your question is yes. Like legacy systems should be constantly reevaluated. Um, 
and, and the question there is like, can we make this better? Can we upgrade it? Can we replace it? Um, but in, in my work and in my practice, a lot of times the goal is like, can we get rid of this? Um, and, and if this legacy system is part of a process, like, can we just get rid of that process? Right. Um, but you know, that, that sounds like something a minimalist would say. Um, so if you're into that sort of thing, then yeah. Who else has other things to say? Yes. This gentleman. I'll race you, Todd. You gotta go around the camera. <laughs> oh, or not. Oh, yeah. man. Awesome. Uh, stereo. Stereo. Uh, <laughs> I really like to use the woodworking metaphor. I'm a garage woodworker on the weekend. and Like Ron Swanson. <laughs> Awesome. Uh, and, and I, you know, <laughs> I've, I've watched all of Norm Abrams' uh, New Yankee Workshop episodes on PBS, and now there's the Wood Whisperer podcast that I am addicted to. And so, like, we've got, you know, the, the people that, that we look up to, there's all kinds of tools, and they can be really simple uh, tools that, that have been around for a really long time, mm -hmm. like the eye. Or you know, really complicated tools that I have to know every knob, uh, you know, what does it do and, and how can I make it do the right thing? Uh, and uh, so th there's a lot of similarities there, but um, what I really like to focus on when I'm talking to people about it is the difference is the cost of material. Hmm. So <laughs> I spend a lot of time measuring when I'm in the wood shop because I don't want to go buy another sheet of plywood. Mm -hmm. Or, or you know, the, the really nice hardwoods. Uh, but our material is characters in a file, usually, uh, that are really easy to destroy and reassemble, and we can have billions and billions of them. So um, how does that change the way we work as crafts, craftsmen from how um, you know, woodworkers work? Like, what do we do differently? And I, th I think the answer is we allow waste to occur where uh, woodworkers can't. Hmm. So we, we do small iterations, we, we try things, and then immediately change them and throw them away and refactor, and it's okay because that waste is almost without cost, hmm. where in, in other worlds it is it has substantial cost. Our expensive waste is like legacy behavior. That's that's the thing I've been seeing lately. Like, so, so that's the waste that we can absorb and that we can afford. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, there's the cost of, the carrying cost of like what we've already built. I guess in that sense, it's less like waste of materials and more like building a bunch of giant pieces of furniture for our little studio apartment and then looking around and realizing, you know, oh my goodness, I like, I have no room. Um, I like that, uh, the, the woodworking analogy. There's other ones out there. Come on, guys. I know it's early. Let's stretch, move. We can do this. There we go. So, uh, for me, the one I know is, is, is time management. So at home, I like, you know, put the kids to bed and I'm like, feel like I'm working straight till I go to bed. Not on like even code stuff, just like around the house. So I have to, you know, in my own mind, I haven't actually put a Kanban board up yet, but in my own mind, I have a prioritized backlog of things that are important. And, you know, I have to deal with the product owner being my wife and say, you know, <laughs> well, you want that done. Well, then you can't have these other three things done because I don't have time to do it. So it's actually been helpful, a lot of the stuff that I've learned at work about, you know, a lot of the agile practices, like, okay, you know, we're going to work on one thing and get it done so we don't have, like, 10 things in progress, like how many of us have like all these house projects that are like 80% done. So I'm trying to start getting <coughs> things more complete at home and I'm still not doing a very good job at it. I'm trying to figure it out, but there's, I definitely see a correlation. Define your definition of done. Yeah, define done is what he yeah, said. That's, that's a good thing. <coughs> Uh, 
uh, just to kind of piggyback off of what John was, was saying about the family, um, kind of going beyond the craft of building software, but looking at the, the interaction of the team and the team dynamic, uh, I'm always looking at parallels with parenting. Hmm. So I have three three kids, and one of the one of the inclinations for parents, and myself included, uh, is you have power over the children because you're bigger and you're smarter, you have more experience. So your tendencies is are to want to control their actions and control their behaviors. And I see this same type of thing happen in, in teams where you have, you know, senior developers or you have a manager who may have knowledge that you don't have. And they they use that knowledge in a damaging in a damaging way and then they, they stifle the creativity of the team. Because part of team dynamic is is learning <coughs> and failing and learning and fail fast and fail often. And I think what what I've seen effective teams do is they allow those maybe more junior developers or senior developers um, and any members of the team they allow those those individuals room and space to make the mistakes and to learn from them and so I try to apply that same the same type of thing with, with my kids it's okay let them you know yeah he's standing on the table and jumping up and down and trying to reach the chandelier okay so in that case, maybe I need to say, get down. But maybe there's other cases where, you know, they're, it's okay for, for them to fall down and get a scrape knee because they learned, they learned from it. And I'm not going to stand there and say, hey, I told you so. I'm going to say, you, you're okay. You, know, you, need a, you need a band aid or something. But I think that those parallels exist on, on any team, on my teams as well, uh, on the software level. I could totally see that. Um, reminds me a little bit of like a recent experience that I've had like taking on an apprentice and like I'm gonna teach this person everything I've ever learned about software and they're going to be a better faster more awesome version of me um, and that was absolutely the wrong idea like so you know one of the pro one of the parts of our apprenticeship process is for the apprentice to determine like a pet project to work on um, and so this particular individual wanted to create a text editor in Ruby as their apprenticeship project. And you know, I've been doing this for a while, so like I knew that that, it, it's six months, right? Six months is when you're supposed to have it done. Like, not, not happening, right? So I'm sitting there like, that is insane. You are never gonna get it done, and I would much rather like, see you work on something that you can complete and you can finish. I will never know whether that person will would have been able to make a text editor in six months, right? Because I, I tried to guide them down a different path. And some days what I wish I had done is say, oh, that sounds like an interesting idea. <laughs> okay, right? <laughs> just, just to see what would happen. And that, that one feels like, like maybe a situation where it's okay to step in, like they're jumping on the table, reaching for the chandelier. Like, I didn't want this person to be devastated. Like that was my motivation for trying to help them reduce the scope or you know pick something less uh, daunting. Um, but I'll never know. And what I'm learning about like mentorship is that it really is just sort of about like helping to show a person where the path is and like clear obstacles out of their way um, and letting them make mistakes. You know. Uh, it's really challenging because you, you're like, oh, I've been there and done that, and like, no, do it this way, but it's not how we learn. Um, so I'm fortunate that I've had mentors who've been kind enough to let me get a skin knee and you know, a bruised elbow every now and again. Um, and I'm trying to become a person who is, does the same, but um, what, I'm, what I'm starting to hear is that maybe I ought to have some kids. I feel like I'd learn a lot about software <laughs> by having kids. <laughs> is, that, is that the wrong motivation for procreation? <laughs> I want to learn about software. Make some babies. <laughs> Maybe not so much. Um, <laughs> that is the exact reason why I haven't yet had children. All right, so who else has got something interesting to share? This is great. Like, I'm, I love being able to you know, hear feedback right away, like fast feedback, right? 
just it's just a small comment about one of your analogies about pair programming and dancing. Uh, you seem a little disappointed because some of us didn't raise our hands. I don't think it's because we don't do pair programming. It's just because we don't know how to dance. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess uh, it's not oriented to the proper audience. One day, if I learn how to dance, I'm dancing. I'm sure I'm going to say, hey, this is like pair, pair programming. <laughs> yeah. I didn't mean to take a, a pot shot and say that you guys haven't done pairing. I was just just trying to get a laugh and, and uh, relax a little bit. But um, I'm, I'm actually not a good dancer. Um, I'm aware that dancing exists, and, and I see, like, the parallels. But kind of what I've been thinking about, like, we... All right, so community issue. I'm going to get up on a soapbox for a second. Like, I'm actually very surprised to see a good, like, balance uh, in terms of gender composition in at this event. I think it's a good thing. Um, you know, I go to lots of conferences and user groups and stuff like that where it's just a bunch of dudes. And I don't know. I mean, I already know how uh, I think and how guys think, and like that, it's cool. But like, I feel like we're missing out on a lot of interesting problem solving. Or interesting approaches to problem solving and communication. Um, anyway, all this is to say, like we have all these drink ups and you know, you know, booze oriented events, and and they're not. I'm not. I'm not saying that that's bad, but I'm. I'm asking if there's room for something else. Like, is there room for a software group to go take a dancing lesson together? Right. Uh, is there room for a, a, a software team to go and observe a kitchen preparing a dinner service? Um, can we? Do, we I, we're smart people and we're creative. I think we can come up with more than just, "Hey, let's go get wasted on somebody's company credit card." Like, you know, I'm not saying don't do that. I'm just saying <laughs> let's do other stuff too. Like, that's not everybody's scene. That's not what everybody wants to do. Like, software brunch. Anybody raise their hand who hates brunch? Nobody. Exactly. Right. Like, Let's go and like do a software brunch at a place that has an open kitchen where we can watch them work and like talk about, you know, their process and our process and like let's let's, let's go do that. I think it'd be a lot of fun. Um, you know, one one central idea that I have is like learning about software can happen anywhere. Like learning is more than just a book or a code or a screencast, or a book or a code. <laughs> Book or a blog post, you know, you get the idea. And, and, you know, work to me is about a lot more than just writing code. Um, a big part of it is about like trying to grow as an individual so that I can, you know, help my team grow, um, so that we can help our community grow, so that we can all help our industry grow um, and get better. So, so that's what a lot of this is about. So, like, go take a dancing lesson. You know, I, why not? Right? What do you got to lose? It's like an hour of your life and maybe you learn something and have some fun. Or, you know, break your leg. But still, then we get to learn about hospitals, which... Um, all right, um, we're getting a little bit low on time, so if anybody else has any other uh, thoughts or ideas they'd like to th throw into the melting pot here? Yes, gentlemen, all the way in the back. Well, I hope you have good insurance if you're going to chuck microphones around. Hospitals. <laughs> so, so was that your sneaky way of, of getting us to walk away with these analogies and, and create events that, um, that align with these analogies? So baseball <laughs> or cooking or kids or anything like that. Uh, taking these analogies and maybe creating some events that are alternatives to just drinking. Oh, man, that's a really good idea. Uh, no, that wasn't really my plan, but if that happens, then I think that that would be awesome. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to, you know, that's what I'm trying to do out in Denver where I am and, like, think of what can we do that will create a, like, open environment or open, like, safe, inviting environment for people to be able to, like, come in from other industries and other domains and be like, hey, software is awesome. Like, um, you know, there's the, the whole idea of, like, be the change that you want to see in the world. Um, so to me, like, that, that's kind of the way to go. Uh, but if you also want to be that change, then I think that, that would be amazing. Like if, 
if these ideas are worthwhile and they're worth doing, then yeah, let's do them. Like, I'm just trying to get some noise out of my head. Um, but I'm hoping that, you know, through that, like, some good things can happen. Um, so we've, you know, kind of taken a, a lightweight approach to, like, how to, how to see different analogs, and like how to, cons it's sort of like intro to being a systems thinker, I guess you could say maybe. Um, you know, so that's good. We have a little framework, like a different way to, to think about things. Um, take it, have some fun with it, like play around with it, like see what works for you and, and uh, get some new ideas. Um, you know, see how we can make other people's lives better. Um, see how we can make the process of developing software better, more efficient. Uh, you know, and, and one more time, thank you very much to, to Todd uh, for inviting me here today and uh, to all the organizers for their hard work, um, to this place for providing a space for us to learn, uh, to you know, the, the companies that support the work that we do and um, everybody that helped me get here today. And thanks to all of you, uh, because this would be a really boring presentation, and has been a really boring presentation when I stand in a giant empty movie theater and give it to myself. Um, so, you know, your community needs you, your team needs you, your, your family needs you, and we all have a lot of responsibility and a lot of things that are important. You know, we're important. People are important. So become better people. Or don't. I mean... That's, that's like really soapboxy, I'm sorry. And then we have to talk about like what's the definition of better. Um, so that's what my next talk will be, the definition of better. Uh, be happy, have fun. Um, thanks for hanging out, everybody have a great day. That's my cat, Leo, by the way. He wishes he could be here today, but he was otherwise engaged with his bubble pipe.